Happy Sabbath ASI family. We trust you had a great week. This is the Adult Lesson Study Panel and I'm your host, Natasha Brown Allen. Whether you're joining us locally, right here in Trinidad and Tobago, or you are a foreign viewer, we are so happy to have you. Whether you're joining us on ASI Media Tobago YouTube channel or on Amplia Cable Channel 102 Tobago Updates Television, Welcome, welcome, welcome. Remember to share the link so that someone else can also be blessed. I want to shout out all our faithful viewers. Tell us in the comments below in the chat where you are joining us from today. Let us know where you are hailing from. We always like to know that so that we can shout out all our viewers. So God bless you and your family. I remind some and inform others that this quarter study guide was written by Pastor Mark Finley, and focuses on the great controversy as we explore the central issues of the conflict between Christ and Satan and how we are impacted. It is recommended that lesson seven that we are looking at today, motivated by hope, should be read in conjunction with chapters 18 through 21 of the book Great Controversy by Ellen G. White. So we encourage you to get the quarterly, whether in hard copy or digital copy at absg.adventist.org. There are also apps available. We also encourage you to get the book, The Great Controversy. And of course, always have your Bible handy, your writing material, your pens, and so forth as we study. Today, as we discuss lesson seven, Motivated by Hope, we have with us on set Pastor Ian Kirk and his dear wife, Sister Anita Kirk, Shepherd and Shepherdess of the New Life Church in Kendall here in the Tobago Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Welcome, Pastor and Sister Cook. Thank you and Thank happy you. Sabbath to all. Awesome, Pleasant awesome. Sabbath, everybody. Let's ask Pastor Cook to pray for us before we begin. We invite you to adopt a reverend position, Pastor Cook. Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, we are thankful for a beautiful day. We are thankful that you have given us your Holy Spirit to stay with us and open our mind and open our understanding. Bless us now as we meditate on your word together. Bless the listeners and the viewers. May they receive that special blessing that will draw them closer to you and closer to each other, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and thank you, Pastor. Our memory text today is taken from Isaiah 25, 9, reading from the New King James Version. It says, And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Mm -hmm. Sister Kirk, will you open our discussion today as you consider our topic and the memory text, please? With all pleasure. The topic is motivated by hope. And, and hope is standing on the promises made by God. When we talk about Bible, right? Mm -hmm. Hope standing on the promises. You're not letting go those promises. And those, this memory verse is sweet. You know, it, it's like saying, all your, all your watch, mm -hmm. behold, all your watch. You have to remember, this is made by those persons alive mm -hmm. when Jesus comes. They have waited for him. Why did they wait for him and why are they so glad? Hey, what they say? They say, this is our God. God why are they saying this is our God? Because if you study the Bible, you will see that there are men, there will be many false cries just before Jesus comes. Many false cries. As a matter of fact, Satan will impersonate Jesus, hmm. you know, walking on earth, healing the sick and doing this and doing that. And we are warned, do not go. When you hear he's there, he's there, he's there, don't go. So those who are belonging to God, he said, we're not going because we know how Jesus is coming back. So they are saying, only watch, watch. This is our God and we have waited for him. It was not just we waited for him because there was pressure. Real pressure, they will not be sitting home eating macaroni pie, <laughs> right? 
they will be somewhere, wherever, in the bush or in the prison or whatever, wherever. We have waited for him and him. he, well. not the one in wherever he is, hmm. he will save us. This is the Lord, not the one who walking on earth day. We have waited for him. It's said twice. That mean, I mean, it's real serious. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Nobody else can save us. This is a wonderful thing. Amen. 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 Thank Amen. you so much, Sister Kirk. You know, and as you spoke, the hymn came to mind, standing on the promises of Christ, Christ my Savior. Savior. Amen. Right. A wonderful song. Oh, yes, a beautiful song. And as we stand on those promises, we are reminded that, you know, God keeps his promises. He is a promise-keeping God. We was recall if you joined us last week for Lesson 6, the two witnesses that we said and we showed you from the Bible that the entire Bible is God's word filled with promises and inspired by the Holy Spirit. So go with us now to the first book of the Bible and the Old Testament, Genesis 3.15, reading from the New King James Version. It says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Here is the first promise of salvation after Adam and Eve sinned. John 3.16 is a familiar passage of scripture from the New Testament. It reads on the New King James Version, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is the fulfillment of the first promise in a nutshell. There are many other texts that we can draw from to show um, this promise being fulfilled. Monday's lesson tells us Christ's disciples misunderstood the nature of the Messiah's first coming. They thought that he would come as a conquering general who would break the yoke of Roman bondage, not one who would deliver them from the condemnation and shackles of sin. Thus, they failed to understand the manner of his first coming. When Christ came the first time as a babe in Bethlehem's manger, very few people discerned his coming. He was killed in our stead, resurrected, and ascended to heaven with the promise that he would return again to save those who believe in him. Hence our memory text. This is the second coming. Pastor Cook, why is the second coming so important to our faith? Now, this is a very important question. And the first point that I would like to share, that the second coming is a fundamental pillar of our faith. Yes. It's a serious point that identify God's people. You see, we look for the coming of Jesus Christ because we were created in the image of God for face-to-face -face communication and face-to-face -face fellowship. And this is what each Sabbath reminds us of, that we must prepare for that face-to-face -face fellowship with Jesus Christ. Sin came and brought a separation. But Jesus wants to restore that face-to-face -face communication and face-to-face -face fellowship. So the second coming will help us to be restored to that oneness because the family of heaven and the family of earth were intended to be together for eternity. The second coming will restore that intention and allow us to have that face-to-face -face fellowship. You see, when Christ comes the second time, the righteous dead will be raised and changed. The righteous living will be changed and together will be caught up to meet him in the air and our fellowship will be sweet forever. So the second coming is a significant part of our name. That's what Adventists mean. The seventh day uh, emphasized the fact that we were created in his image and we were created for fellowship face to face. The second coming will help us to realize or restore us to that face to face fellowship. My prayer is that all of us in the hearing of my voice be ready for that second coming and that face-to-face -face fellowship. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, Pastor. So the second coming of Christ is that blessed hope that we as a church, 
look forward to the grand climax of the gospel. Hence our topic this week, motivated by hope. Now that we know why the second coming is important, what does the Bible tell us about the manner of Jesus' second coming? Let's start with Sister Cook and then Pastor Cook. Right. The manner of Jesus' second coming. How will Jesus return? You know, um, my favorite text mm -hmm. is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Can I just read um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? It says, I will paraphrase it. It says, listen, I don't want Ali to be ignorant about something very important. The way how Jesus is coming back will be no quietly something. And, you know, it says, uh, for, the for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. This is the text, the piece of the passage. He will descend with a shout. It don't mean just he making noise. Mm. He will descend with a, with, with a shout. What kind of shout? With the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. I want to spend a little time there. When Jesus comes back, it will be a glorious something. We just can say it will be glorious. How mm -hmm. glorious it will be, you have to be there to Hallelujah. see. But it will mm -hmm. be, I mean, angels who mm -hmm. can blow the trumpet and whatever they will blow, I don't know. But it will be music in the air. You know which song comes to my mind? Um, Oh, what glorious sight appears. So all you know, believe this song, in us. Right. And you know, there's some uh, song, a piece that say, hear the band of music, hear the band of music. It will be singing. No, there's no band in church that can play music. So it will be glorious. It will be beautiful. That's all I can say. Just be there and see. You know, and the other point is, it will be personal. I love the promise made in John chapter 14, verse 1 to 3, where Jesus say, watch, hmm. I go to prepare a place for you, right? And when I come back, this piece is so nice, I will take you to myself so that where I am, there you will be also. Yes. When Jesus comes back, he's not sending nobody for us, you know, he's coming back for himself. The reason why he's coming back for himself, he wants to take us where he is for himself. I mean, it will be personal. Jesus loves me bad. He loves you. And he is coming back for me. Personal. I think those are two points. Pastor Kirk, maybe you can touch the others. Yeah, there are three more important points or additional impo mm. important points that we like to share. One, according to Revelation 1, uh, 7, Behold, he cometh with a cloud, and every eye shall see him. In other words, the second coming of Jesus Christ will be visible. Mm. If anybody has to tell you that Jesus is here, mm. he's not here. <laughs> because there will be no know. secret about it. Mm. Every eye shall see at the same time. If you are blind, you open your eye. <laughs> every eye shall see it. Is coming at the same time. And the third, the, sec the second point is, it will be worldwide. Just as cloud cover the entire world, the entire hemisphere, Jesus will be coming with clouds of angels. And there are enough angels in heaven to circle this globe. And Jesus will be seen by everyone at the same time. How that will happen, I don't know. You have to be there to see it. Mm. But everyone will see at the same time. Therefore, it will be global. It will be worldwide. And the third point, it will be literal. Because every individual will be affected by the coming of Jesus Christ. First, those who are righteous and are alive, your whole being will change. Your body will be changed. If you're righteous but dead, you'll be raised to life. If you're wicked and alive, you will die. So every living person will be affected by the coming of Jesus Christ 
So it will be literal. It is not a secret rapture. It is a literal, worldwide, visible, personal event. Let's all be ready for that event so that we can be among the righteous to be with Jesus Christ forever. Let's be ready. Amen and amen. Thank you so much. This is the event. If you've missed any other events before, that's totally fine. But you see, this one that's coming here, you don't want to miss it. This is the event of all time. Jesus' second coming. And don't just be present, be saved. You know, don't just be alive, but be saved because there will be wicked who will be alive. And run to the rocks and, and mountains. And they'll be running to the rocks and the mountains. But we want to run towards Jesus. You know, yeah. we want to be saying, as the text yeah. says, Lord, this is our, our God. God. We have waited for him and he will save us. So we want to be there. But then we also have some who will be dead. We'll have some dead wicked and we'll have dead righteous. And you know, death is all around us. Every week we hear about death. And, you know, let's talk about what the resurrection means, the promise of the resurrection. What does this mean to us? Sister Kirk. The promise of the resurrection gives us hope. It, it makes life meaningful. To, to, to give your life to Jesus and to love Jesus, and then when you're dead, you're done. I mean, that would be terrible. The promise of the resurrection. God is saying, listen, no matter what you're going through, poverty or whatever, whatever, there comes a time when I will resurrect you. That is what Jesus is saying. And you know, those um, early believers, they suffered a lot, boy. They were tortured. They had to suffer because they believe in Jesus and they were looking forward like Jesus coming next year, hmm. next two years. And Jesus in come. That had to be hard for their family and friends. But the hope of the resurrection tells us that when the believer goes to sleep, the next second, the next split of a second, he wakes up and sees Jesus coming. He does not know that he slept so long. So the hope of the resurrection gives the Christian life meaning. There is no religion that promises that. We thank God for the resurrection. That's why it's worth serving Jesus. No matter when you die, no matter how long you have waited for Jesus, don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged when family members die. Because the next split second, they will see Jesus. Amen. Let's trust Amen. him. Amen. Amen. And the Apostle Paul says, what well, comfort one another with these with words. With these <laughs> words, man. Yes, when our loved one dies, while they do not go to heaven right away, because we do not believe that, that they go to heaven right away, death is but a sleep. We believe that they are sleeping until Jesus comes. And that resurrection promise gives us hope, gives us comfort, that once we are saved, even if we die, we will still be resurrected to eternal life. And that's why I think it was um, in First Thessalonians says that um, those who are alive and remain until the coming of God will by no means precede those who are asleep. So all of us, and it goes on to say, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Yeah. And then those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Reading from 1 Thessalonians 4, and I read from about verse 14 to 18 there. Paraphrasing, of course. So we have this hope that burns within our heart, hope in the coming of the Lord, and that even though we may fall asleep, in Christ, we will be resurrected. Pastor Cook, um, let's go to uh, William Miller now. What did William Miller discover as he studied the Bible that has impacted our legacy of beliefs? This is a very important question to, and a very important area of, topic, of, of study. William Miller, Miller discovered the manner of Jesus' coming. There was a little error in his understanding in the implication of his coming, but he understood the manner of his coming. This understanding 
was very important to us as a church. As I said before, the understanding of the second coming of Jesus influenced the early pioneer to name, to name the church. So our identity is wrapped up with that understanding. But when Jesus comes the second time, he'll be coming to take the righteous home to heaven. But William taught that in 1844, Jesus was coming to this earth to purify the earth. The error caused the brethren, the Millerite, to search themselves and to be at peace with their God. But the understanding of that coming was that he's going to the most holy place, cleansing the most holy place, and not coming to the earth, which is the second coming that we are still looking for. The second coming, as I said before, is a very important pillar of our faith, the 25th pillar of our faith. And we look forward to that day when we'll have that reunion with those who have gone before, who have died, but will be resurrected and be changed. Those who are alive will be changed. That is what will happen at the second coming. But in Miller's day, it was the beginning of a special phase of Christ's ministry in heaven that the 2300 days pointed forward to. But he understood, he discovered the manner of his coming, which is very important for us as we look forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Pastor, for that summary there. Um, you know, some people think of, or, and we have also said it, you know, 1844 is a great disappointment. Mm. But we can also see it as a great appointment, appointment yeah. you know, where Jesus, as you said, moved from the holy place to the, the most, most holy, holy place. place. Yeah. And there now he's interceding on our behalf. And so while it may have been an error in computation of the date, and you know, we must always also be mindful of the fact that the Bible also says that no man knows the day or yeah. the hour of his it's coming. coming. Yeah. So we should learn a lesson from that, that we should not go about trying to um, compute or, or, or decide, decipher what day Jesus is going to come. Because we've seen many people in times past who have done that and what? Jesus still hasn't come because no one knows the day of the hour of his coming. So what we have to do is to what? Get ready and stay ready. So that no matter what time he comes, we will always be ready for his second coming. Amen. Right? Yeah. So let's look now at Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Daniel 9, 20, 24 to 27. 70 weeks are determined. It's a long passage. Um, let me see how best I could summarize that. And then I'll ask Sister Kirk to speak about the significance of these verses in establishing the integrity of the Bible and the divinity of Christ. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy, reading from the King James Version. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous sorry yes even in troublous times and after three score and two weeks shall messiah be cut off but not for himself and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease and for the overspreading of the abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and, the determin and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So, so, Sister Kirk, just give us a little bit on this text and how it establishes the integrity of the Bible and the divinity of Christ. And of course, any other comments you'd want to share on this text? Yes. Now, prophecy is sweet. What I like about prophecy is that God says something, as they say in Tobago, donkey years before it happens. 
And it is so nice to see that exactly what God says happens. Mm -hmm. When God prophesies something and it happens exactly, you can't doubt that this is from God. This prophecy here, it, it's nice because God said, in other words, listen, there will be so much time passed and then the Messiah will come and then the Messiah will die. Let us look at it. We have already established that in prophecy one day, when they say a day, it's really equal to a year, right? Mm -hmm. So if one day is equal to a year, then seven days or one week is seven years, right? So we have here the decree issued by Artaxerxes happened in 457 BC, before Christ, 457 BC. They said, listen, Olya, you can go back. I'm giving a command, you can go back to re rebuild uh, Jerusalem. And this was then the beginning of the 2300 day prophecy or 2300 years prophecy. But the nice part where the Messiah comes in, they said, that um, in, in this prophecy, Daniel predicts that from the going forth of the commandment, that means from 457 BC, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem to the Messiah, to Jesus, to Jesus Christ will be 69 prophetic weeks. How many years is 69 prophetic weeks? A little math. That is 69 multiplied by 7 is 483 years. And you have to remember that there is no year zero, right? So 483 years from 450, uh, when you add, for, add that to 400, from at 457 BC, mm -hmm. 457 plus. 483 will take us so nice to AD 27. And you know what happened in AD 27? Check your quarterly. Let me read it exactly how it says. How it says here. Since the decree went forth in the fall of 457 BC, 483 years extend to the fall of AD 27. The word Messiah signifies the anointed one. In the autumn of AD 27, something special happened. What mm -hmm. happens? Christ Jesus happened. Christ was baptized. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ was baptized and received the anointing of the Spirit. After his baptism, Jesus went into Galilee. What he went to do in the Galilee? He went to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled. And then it continues so nicely. It says in the spring of AD 31, in the middle of the last prophetic week, one week is seven years, right? So in the middle will be three and a half, mm -hmm. right? Three and one week is seven years in the in the middle will be three and a half years. Mm -hmm. So nice that from AD 27 when Jesus was baptized, exactly three and a half years mm -hmm. after he his baptism, crucified. Jesus was crucified. Hmm. Can you doubt that Jesus was the Messiah when hmm. years ago it was prophesied? Hmm. No doubt at all. You know, so the seventh, when Jesus was crucified, we... We, we, we cannot doubt. There was no doubt that this is the Messiah. And something interesting happened at the end of the 70 weeks. What happened at the end of 70 weeks? Hmm. Three things happened. You know, Stephen was stoned, and the Jews were rejected as a nation, and then the gospel went to the heathen, to everybody. Prophecy shows you cannot doubt that Jesus is divine that Jesus is God. I think that says it all. Amen. Thank you, Sister Kirk. Her teacher hat came on there. Thank you so much. Um, Pastor Kirk, any additional lessons you would like to share with us from these verses and also um, help us 
in terms of what, do, what is the role that prophecy plays in the plan of salvation? Because most people might say, see me and this prophecy thing. <laughs> I'm not on that. So share with us any additional lessons from Daniel 9, 24 to 27, and why understanding prophecy um, is important in the plan of salvation. You see, the first point, prophecy give us, gives us tangibles to anchor our faith in truth. Because fulfilled prophecy is now history. And you can look back at your history and literally see Jesus' role in the salvation of men. This 2300-day prophecy identified the ministry of Jesus Christ on earth, his the beginning of his ministry, his crucifixion, where he died in our stead, in your stead, so that you can have life and have it abundantly. So prophecy has a very significant role in helping man to understand the plan of salvation and to see Jesus in his role as our substitute, the lamb that take away the sins of the world and the, the, the substitute for my sin, which is the righteousness of Christ. Prophecy helps us to see that point very clearly. And the 2300-day prophecy, the events are now history. And you can go back into history book and see the fulfillment of this prophecy. Thus, your faith in the truth of the Bible is increased. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you can trust God's word. You can trust the truth of the Bible and you can see Jesus working, uh, working out a way that you can be forgiven for your sins and be saved when he comes a second time. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor. And if you have the lesson guide and you go to Friday's further thought, it gives you a nice little chart that you can look at. So I trust that you would have your quarterlies and you can go there for a reference showing the 2300 days um, prophecy in a nice chart, you know, for those who are more visual learners. You can go there. So, Pastor and Sister Kirk, as we seek to wrap up this week's lesson, share with our viewers any closing thoughts that you may have as it relates to this lesson and encourage and motivate somebody to, you know, to share the same hope that we have in the coming of the Lord. Let's start with Sister Kirk and then Pastor Kirk. Okay, that's fine. You know, studying this lesson helped me to just be grateful to God. Mm -hmm. Grateful to God that he knows the future. And not just that he knows the future. He told us what will happen yeah. in the future. What to look forward to. So we, we, we do have to doubt. It, it, it makes you feel good because I know, I know. Things will be rough. Things will be tough. But I know because Jesus said it. You know, let's study the Bible. Let's believe prophecy. Because when Jesus says something, it will happen. The hope of the resurrection, I, I just love it. Because so many of our friends, so many relatives are dying. Let's believe. Let's hold on to that promise. And we will be blessed. Thank Praise you. Praise the Lord. But the topic of this, this week's um, study was motivated by hope. And as was said... Hope is standing on the promises. But I want you to, to encourage you to live by faith. Motivated by hope, but live by faith. Mm. You see, hope is standing on the promises, but faith is acting, mm. walking on the promises. Mm. Let's move forward by faith, knowing that that which will happen, the second coming of Jesus Christ will happen. Amen. Because prophecies that have been fulfilled already, fulfilled exactly, exactly as it was presented. That means the coming of Jesus Christ will be exactly as it is presented in the, in the, uh, in the word of God. Amen. You see, if you cannot avoid the coming, the mm. smart thing to do mm. is to prepare for it. Amen, amen. So when Jesus comes, he can say to you, well done, good and faithful servants. 
enter thou into the joys of thy Lord. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Kirk and Sister Kirk. I think that was a wonderful end and we surely yes. hope that you will be motivated to continue to hold on to Christ. And if you are not yet a Bible-believing Christian and you are listening to this podcast, we trust that you will give your heart to the Lord so that we all can be ready to meet him when he comes again. We'll ask us the Kirk to pray for us to end. Join us in a reverent position. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you so much for this lesson. We thank you so much for for the hope we have. Help us to continue to trust you and help us to continue to share the hope we have with others so that they too can know about you, they too can have this closer walk with you and together all of us can be ready, stay ready until you come on the clouds. What a glorious day that will be. May we all be ready, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. amen and amen. Thank you again, Pastor and Sister Kirk. Thank you, viewers. God bless you. And we'll see you next time for Lesson 8, Light from the Sanctuary. Until then, stay prayerful because that's how we connect with God. God bless you. Until next time. Bye.